Warning, this review contains massive spoilers for Volume 3 of Ruby. If you do not wish to be spoiled, please watch the show and come back later. Seriously, we are talking super major, rip your monitor out of the wall, screaming worthy spoilers. Ruby was created by Monty Ohm and is owned by Rooster Teeth. Please support the official release. Hey folks, welcome to the inaugural episode of Radical Casual Reviews, an awesome review show brought to you by the Stony Brook Independent. Here in Radical Casual Reviews, we take a look at anything ranging from anime to video games to movies to books, even sometimes politics. Even if you don't like politics. I'm Kevin. And I'm Janelle. And today we are actually going to be looking at a pretty cool show called Ruby. Particularly, we're looking at volume three of Ruby. As a note, if you only want to watch one section of the review, not the entire thing, click any of the annotations on this side of the screen and you'll be taken to the proper location. Because screw the other stuff. But anyway... Kevin, what exactly is Ruby? Well, Ruby is a 3D web animation series created by Rooster Teeth's Monty Ohm, known for making animations with over-the-top violence and a continual sense of humor. Ruby takes place in the land of Remnant, where warriors known as Huntresses and Huntsmen fight to keep the soulless creatures of Grimm at bay. Fun fact, the world of Remnant was actually born at IHOP when Ohm squirted some ketchup onto a napkin. The show follows the titular team Ruby, one of many teams training at Beacon Academy in the Kingdom of Vale. Here, they strive to become defenders of the realm as they go through school, make new friends, and try to stop all civilization from collapsing. The team features 15-year-old Ruby Rose, who managed to get into Beacon Academy two years early, Weiss Schnee, heiress to the Schnee Dust Company, Blake Baldona, the mysterious girl with a secret, and Yang Zhao Long, Ruby's sister and an outgoing party girl. Also, Ohm decided to choose the voice actresses based on how well they fit the personality of each character. Each character has their own unique weapon, style, and abilities generated by their semblance, which is essentially the manifestation of their soul. Through their aura, basically a semblance's power supply, they can often shrug off being thrown through pillars and getting shot. And yes, pretty much all of their weapons are also guns. Get used to it. It's pretty awesome. And now, on to the review. To begin with, the music. The music is pretty, pretty awesome, just if you're only paying some passive attention to it. Like I do, I'm just like, whoa, this rock music kicks butt. <laughs> Meanwhile, I look into it a little bit more in depth. For instance, this season had, as far as I could tell, more re-renditions of previous songs than any other. I heard at least, I think, two different versions of both I Burn, Mirror Mirror, and I think from Shadows throughout the season in addition to their original version. Yo, Neon, go! It's familiar, but at the same time, it's a little bit different each time, and it's a very, very nice thing to have consistent through it. Yeah, it fit in very well. Probably the only musical complaint I have is with the opening, and you actually didn't have any problems with that. Yeah, the volume three opening starts with a do 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 but a on piano. A bit of a piano rift. And then it goes into something hardcore, which I interpret as a disruption of what was a long-held peace, serenity of sorts, and that's just like... I actually just saw it as it starts out very quiet and honestly, I like listening to piano, but I'm so used to associating Ruby's music with more of a rock theme that I just didn't like the piano opening. The entirety of the rest of the theme, the other 90%, I had very little to no problem with. I will say though, the ending songs, I, I loved some of those ending songs. Like, they took the rock theme and added some other elements that I adore. And if you listen to the lyrics, though, you're going to be like, wow, this is kind of dark. Previous songs that have done that, Die. <laughs> Red Like Roses Part 2. Definitely the opening of Volume 3. Just listen to the songs, then listen to the lyrics. It's actually kind of amazing. Yeah, it is. 
And now we're gonna have to move on to the next section. So now we get into the meat of the show, the plot. God, why? And you know that your show is gonna be positive when it starts with a main character talking to her mother's grave. I'm going to be in my grave soon with this plot, holy crap. Yeah, yeah you will. The first half of the series mostly takes place in the vital festival mentioned in Season 2. You know, it's basically a Pokemon tournament, but with people and weapons and guns in the sky. Yeah. Because why not? Basically. So, the festival is split into three sections. 4v4, so full teams. 2v2, where we meet Penny for the season. And 1v1... Mainly, there are two matches you have to pay attention to. The 1v1 of Yang versus Mercury, where Yang wins, and then she sees Mercury attack her. And everyone saw Yang attack Mercury. Who is an innocent boy? Yeah, we'll get back to that later. <laughs> and the other match is Pyrrha versus Penny. Which comes right after, and it was intentionally set up by the villains. Yep. Cinder unintentionally realized that Penny was actually a cyborg and so decided to set up the girl who controls magnetism versus the girl made of metal. Not a happy ending and it was one I kind of curled up in the corner and died. Yeah, since, you know, someone died, there's actually utter panic. Which, if you remember the rest of the series, oh. panic, terror, angst, fear, all that kind of stuff. Brings the Grim over, which is yeah. bad. Yeah, so you have Grim from all over the area coming towards Vale and invading. Not a very happy thing, and when you combine it with the White Fang also deciding to come in and take advantage of this and literally drop some of the Grim into the city, it's honestly what he said as a very, very, very not nice move. Yeah. And actually, there is so much panic going on that we are introduced to two new types of Grimm. The Griffins, which look cool but came out of friggin' nowhere. And the Grimm Dragon. Yeah, a dragon. A dragon. A Grimm so large and powerful that it just kind of circles the school, literally dropping Grimm onto the ground. It was enough to make the headmaster of the school be like, oh, darn. Wow, that's pretty bad. Yeah, and so... Uh, Ozpin decided to enlist Pyrrha Nikos because she was next in line to become the Fall Maiden. Yes, it turns out that the fairy tales in this world upon this are system. real. Yay! One of them being the tale of four maidens, where, to keep it short, four people have actual magic in this universe. You don't not, need dust. Not just dust, not just semblances, actual magic. However, as we learn in the villain's backstory, Cinder met up and recruited Emerald, and then they met up and recruited Mercury, who is the son of an assassin, and then the three of them decided to find and drain the power from the Autumn Maiden, using some kind of surgical glove that managed to let a grim bug out temporarily and spit ooze on the Maiden's face. Poor lady. Which gave Cinder part of the Maiden's power, until a new character to the series saved her. And that would happen to be Ruby's awesomely always drunk uncle, but we'll get into him later. Yes, we will. <laughs> so much. So, with the city kind of falling to pieces, and Pyrrha inheriting the Fall Maiden's remaining power... Or at least going to. That doesn't work out very well. Cinder kills the Fall Maiden. Because she has to mess up everything and be a good villainess. And as a result... Cinder gains the full Fall Maiden's powers in a really amazing fight that we'll get to a bit later. Yep, that's safe for a whole separate section. Final episode. Yep. And that's the plot up until the final episode. See you in the next section. And now let's talk about Cin Cinder as a character. Really quite a villainous, wouldn't, that, wouldn't you say so, Kevin? Oh, yeah. Uh, in the middle of the season, when she found out that Penny was a cyborg, you could see just how adaptive she was. She had no idea of it ahead of time, and yet she just worked into her plans so that Pyrrha would fight Penny and cause panic. Very, very, very bad panic, which the Grimm really, really love. But I also want to point out, of course, she is very, very manipulative and pretty much the antithesis to everything that is good. She literally 
made a plan to capture the maidens, taking advantage a maiden, taking advantage of their kindness. She got Emerald to cast an illusion of a child in pain on the side of the road, knowing Fall Maiden would go after her. Speaking of Emerald, we learn a lot more about her. For instance, her semblance is to make an illusion, which also causes her to be invisible to whoever she's casting it on. Nice trick. She also started as a thief, but doesn't seem to be completely evil. When Vale was just being overrun with Grimm, she looked horrified. It's actually kind of sad, is what she said, and she, who knows, maybe we'll see her turn. But she actually has a bit of a heart in comparison to Cinder and Mercury, who is basically the evil gesture. And honestly, he was recording it to probably to put it on YouTube and try to be famous here. And he was really just getting off on the misery of everyone. He was smiling with glee. Now, and this was after figuring out that when Cinder first met him, he was right next to his dead father and the burning house in the background. Put two and two together. It's pretty obvious what happened. We don't quite know the exact specifics, but the implication is that Mercury probably was at least in a fight. Maybe was one that killed his father. Very interesting team we have on the villain side, but the heroes are also pretty interesting too. Pretty early on, we're introduced to Ruby's Uncle Crow, mentioned as far back as the first episode of the series. And he's always drunk. Always. However, he's also always a complete badass. He has a giant sword that is also a shotgun that bends into a scythe. Three weapons, one awesome man. Continual badass. He's also sarcastic at every possible opportunity. But he's honest. Very yeah, honest. You gotta appreciate that. And he gets into a fight with Winter Schnee, Weiss's sister. Who, I'm gonna say, is really, really an awesome bigger sister. And she's a very nuanced character in comparison to some of them. She has the strict militaristic attitude that pretty much is bred into Atlesians but still clearly thinks about and cares about Weiss, even helping her train her semblance. For example, like in the beginning when you first see her, she points, Winter points out that Weiss messed up a couple times, three times, and was like, Bleh. but then you also ask, see her later asking, how are you doing? And then you see Weiss going off into the da 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 on her school stuff. And then she's like, no, Winter says. How are you doing? Are you eating? Are you making friends? And this and that. So you really see two sides of her, and it's a very, very interesting balance kind of going on. And there are innumerable other characters introduced. Probably maybe a dozen or so named characters because there's a lot of fighting. But then, of course, there's all of the visiting characters from every other kingdom. And even among the named characters, there are moments of characterization for each of them. You care about all the characters, and you don't want any of them to go down. You see all their quirks, all their little things, whether it's the peppiness of the character that looks like Neon Cat. Trumpet. Trumpet guy was really cool. <laughs> he had swag. Mad swag. I'd date that dude. <laughs> but yeah, basically, lots of little characters, lots of awesome moments. And with that, we get to the fights, which are universally awesome this season. Badass. An exemplar is when Crow fought Winter. We were able to see the characters' personalities show through excellently. Crow was literally grinning and cocky as hell. He was just like, whoop, 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 dodging all of Winter's attempts to stab him. Like, meh, whatever. And then we're like, he's like, oh, we're going to try your way for a little while. Fence, fence, fence. Nah. <laughs> And then it just goes all over the place very fast, very well choreographed. You see the entire area torn up just enough to where, you know, not everyone's going to die, but to where it's pretty awesome. You got to see both characters show some real skill there. I would not mess with any of them. Meanwhile, when you get over into the Vital Festival, both the 4v4s and the 2v2s show excellent team choreography. Every team is in sync and just works together like clockwork. Ruby, obviously, you've seen that since season one, how they're always so in sync. They barely have to talk to be able to come up with a good strategy. But I'm also going to point out Team Juniper. There was one example, particularly, where they just were able to come up with something on the spot, where they, we went off Jean Shield, Pierre went up, blocked a sniper shot that would have otherwise taken down Nora, who, in the end, went on to basically get, was it a quadruple kill or a triple kill? It was a quad. Overkill. Nora, just hit it with your hammer. 
I mean, in a way, it's not quite team coordination to the extent, but it's very, very well played out. And they, in the end, they are. You can tell they're a really good team. Then, when the festival comes to an end, because everything's going wrong, you get to see students fighting Graham. And unlike in the end of Season 2, it is done so well this time. You see pretty much every student in the main cast take down a Nevermore, a giant one at that, and then they go on to each fight Grimm, normally one-on-one, -on -one, occasionally a couple students on one Grimm or an Elysian mech. Meanwhile, the camera's flying around to different angles and different areas of the city to show off the different people and to show off that this isn't just some skirmish. It's a war. A full-on war. You had to emphasize that. And so we make it to the final episode of the season. Blake and Yang have escaped Adam after he stabbed Blake in the abdomen, caused Yang to go Super Saiyan, and then cut off Yang's arm. Blake then tried to protect Yang, and Adam decapitated her shadow. Which is a pretty messed up move considering they were pretty close before. Meanwhile, over with Weiss, she managed to summon an arm and it cut an Elysian Paladin in half in one swing. It's worth noting that when she was training with Winter, Winter said you have to think about what will push, what's will push, been pushing you to your very limit and that would help you with this. And obviously she was pushed here to her very limit wanting to protect Velvet. Velvet and the rest of her friends. Yes. Particularly Velvet in that very second though, but yes. True. Meanwhile, throughout all this, the Grim Dragon is just kind of circling the school, attracting Grim to location and probably dropping more on the city. Yep, pooping some lots, uh, pooping problems onto the city. Yep. Then you have Cinder, who is now a maiden with full powers against Ozpin. To put it this way, she is so powerful that she just lets Pyrrha and Jean leave. There's... Then some Dragon Ball C like Z like kind of stuff going on here. Like we are talking explosions. Barrel, 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 barrel. Very, very quick, very, very fast. It honestly pretty much dwarfs anything we had seen in any of the previous seasons, and even in this season, I'm willing to argue. Would you agree with that, Kevin? Oh yeah. Cinder's fires by the middle of the fight with Alice Pin were probably as large as Cinder mm -hmm. herself. If not larger. Yeah. Meanwhile, over with Pyrrha and Jean, Pyrrha decides to actually kiss Jean. The Arcos ship has set sail. Hallelujah. She then locks him in a rocket locker like Carden did in the first season and blasts him off to somewhere else. And this has a lot of consequences that honestly sent me into that corner. Yeah. Pyrrha then goes up the tower to go meet Cinder for a final fight. Jean, who has finally landed calls up as many of his friends as he can. He can only contact Team Ruby, though. And so Ruby and Weiss make a plan to get Ruby to the top of the tower. Pretty much in the same way that they killed the Nevermore back in the middle of the first season. And what ha is happening up at the top of that tower, Pyrrha has reached Cinder, and she's actually putting up a very intense fight you would expect for what would have been the would-be maiden. She is actually landing hits on Cinder and really giving it her all there and it's really admirable honestly. And actually by the end of the fight Pyrrha uses her semblance to pull pretty much all of Ozpin's gears, all of the metal in the office around Cinder who then explodes it away. But she used the force here and that was pretty awesome. So Ruby gets to the top of the tower right in time to see Cinder kill Pyrrha. Era right here, and then disintegration. So unlike Penny here, who was turned into quarters, there's nothing left here of Pyrrha, and I... Oh, oh, oh God, I can't. Can there I is finish? no chance of Pyrrha coming back, unless they pull some absolute deus ex machina on the next season. <sighs> it's Ruby not then goes supernova. Not Super Saiyan, supernova. Pretty much... Blinding she, light. She has silver fire erupting from her eyes, and wipes out the entire screen. Cinder screams as well. She is not happy about this whole Cinder thing. doesn't... Cinder didn't even expect it. The first time, Cinder didn't prepare for something. She did not adapt to that. So, then the screen goes white for a solid minute, 
as you get a bit of exposition, mainly from Crow. And then you have Ruby waking up in her bed with her dad at her side. It's some time later. It's not that he specified. It's still in the fall, though. And Yang is... Gone. Defeated. Not dead. Just defeated. The spirit you saw from her is just completely eviscerated. Her arm, it's a stub. And her spirit is just no can do here. Everything she says is basically gone. Their old life. It's all gone. The school, Penny, Pira, and... Yang, where are Weiss and Blake? Weiss's father came for her. What? What do you mean? No one outside of Vale knows what happened here. Before the tower fell, the last thing people saw was Atlas attacking innocent people and Grim destroying the city. Everyone's scared. No one knows who to trust. So Weiss's father came to take her back to Atlas, where he thinks it's safe. She's gone. What about- And Blake ran! Sun saw her go. After we got to the city, she just... ran. But... why? I don't know. And I don't care. And so, you have a bit of a montage where fall goes to winter, Ruby leaves her house, joins up with the rest of Team Juniper, and they have the plan to head out to Haven which is their only lead for how to find Cinder and her team. Yeah, it looks like Cinder apparently survived. Damn it. And in the final scene of the season, you just get a shot of who is presumed to be Cinder's boss. Yeah, Cinder has a boss, it looks like. And honestly, considering what we saw from Cinder, who basically went full god mode with the maiden powers, that's not a good thing. And this crazy, scary boss, red eyes... Pale white. Veins. Basically presiding over what looks to be hell. Is that right to say? Yeah, and it looks like hell. It's, it, and it's, we're not even talking like, you know, the situation we saw before where everything is gone. It was actual hell here. And they, she mentioned Ozpin. They go back. And that's going to be exciting to see. There's going to be a lot of exciting things to see, right, Kevin? Oh, yeah. So, that was Volume 3 of Ruby. And not sure about you, but I cannot wait for season four. I kill yeah, me to wait a year. Yeah, I mean, I binge watched through one and two and then three. I really don't know how I'm going to get way through this because honestly, this is like kind of getting off crack and I'm going to have some very bad draw systems, Kevin, don't you think? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm probably going to end up watching the entire show again like next week. Yep. All in one period of time when you should be studying for your midterms, right? Yeah, I probably should. Meh. Studying's overrated. Ruby anyway. is not. Until next time, I'm Kevin Mady. I'm Janelle, and yeah, I'm gonna go back to the corner now. Bye.